to lunch in out of the marketing. I am up here. Uh, my name is Derek Merriman, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing. Pleased to meet you all. And I'm up here with Stacy Collick from Dollar Bill Printing. And we are up here to kick up the program. Uh, who's here for your very first Lunch in Armor Marketing program? One, two, three, okay, I want you to be there. Well, welcome, welcome. You're in for a real treat today. Uh, yeah. Let me just tell you a little bit about Lunch in Armor Marketing. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, which we worked very hard to get that status. Uh, Bob Shannon in the back is our accountant. Bob helped us over the years to get that status. Thank you, Bob. And uh, this is an all-volunteer organization, or at least it has been for the last four years. And so it's all volunteer. Uh, we do. We did recently hire one employee, so Mary Lou Holtz is the LA's manager, because there was just too much work. We have, we have weekly meetings here at Conor O'Neill's, and uh, we are a 501c3, so we donate back to the community. Uh, last year we donated a thousand dollars to the Ann Arbor Public School System to help fund some of their marketing and advertising initiatives for their students and we hope to continue doing that so uh, it is free to attend these meetings so those of you who are new and I know we have some Skyline students here can I see the Skyline Woo! okay thanks for coming yeah we love America's youth and even one of them is, is in camouflage it's, it's, so. it's homecoming yeah. oh it's homecoming wait a minute I gotta get it so don't be alarmed by the person in camo in the middle <laughs> But, um, I hit some warning on this. Yeah, so it's free to be here. It's free to be here, which is great. If you want lunch, it's 10 bucks. As you'll see on the sheets with the menus, that money goes to Connor Meals. They give us a really good deal. That includes your your uh, your lunch, your drink, and tip, which is nice. You're always welcome to um, tip extra to the men and women in black. They do every job here. Um, Stacy is up here. Stacy is our treasurer. Okay, so she passes the hat. That's how we fund ourselves is by passing the hat. We do it old school. All right. If you want to throw in a few bucks, we suggest three. You're welcome to. You don't have to. Okay. Like I said, it's free to be here. So Stacy's going to pass the basket. Thank you, Stacy. And this money goes to fund some of our hard costs, and then any money we have at the end of the year, we donate uh, back to the community and support marketing initiatives. Um, other way we get support is from our sponsors. So Carter Sherlin over here, Frog Print Studios, is our sponsor this month. He is a great photographer, uh, portrait photographer, event photographer, and there's a bunch of cards laying around from Frog Prince. I encourage you to grab one. Uh, Carter also takes pictures at the event, so he volunteers his time for that. So thank you, Carter. Do you want to say something? Dennis is going to say something. Actually, I was told Dennis is going to say something. Okay, Dennis is going to say something. Dennis is going to say something. I had an idea since we're a marketing uh, group, and I want to have a little fun with Carter. So what I want to do is a uh, commercial form. And uh, Carter Sherline from Frog Print Studios over there taking pictures of me. Uh, he does everything except for weddings. And you want to get a LinkedIn or a photo for Facebook, it costs about $50. So contact Carter, and he'll be here after the end of the meeting to talk to you about it. That's a special price for LA2M members. Special price for LA2M. Normally it would be $150 for executive portrait. We're just down $50. So a photo session with Carter Sherline is priceless, as they said. <laughs> okay, let me talk about this real quick. So next month's sponsor, which doesn't start till next month, but I'll save you from talking about this, is the uh, Search Marketing Workshop uh, with Bud Gibson from Eastern Michigan University and a lot of great people. Google, Pure Michigan, Quicken, a lot of people are involved in this. Uh, this these, these guys are sponsoring for October, November, and there's some flyers out, so I encourage you to attend this program. There's going to be some great speakers. We're at half capacity already, so... They're at half capacity. They expect to be at full capacity. So, and just to give you an idea, um, if anyone checks in on Foursquare, does anyone here use Foursquare? One, two, okay, two of you, three of you, thank you. Four of us. Um, and me, and Carter, yeah. So Carter used to be the mayor, but now we have Mayor Jim. So check in at LA2M, LA2M on Foursquare. Be sure to tweet about this. Use the hashtag LA2M. Uh, Aaron O'Neill from Ingenix is, is running the LA2M Twitter. So she's going to be tweeting a lot of the brilliant things that our speaker says. Um, you notice I am wearing a shirt, LA2M shirt, okay? These are $12.50, is that right, $12.50? Which is almost at cost. I encourage you to buy them. Buy one for your birthday gifts for other people, buy it for your children, <laughs> buy it for yourself. They're $12.50 and you can buy them before or after the program and they look really nice. See, they look good on me. And we actually always give a shirt to our speaker, so Cliff, here's your famous LA Web shirt. Thank you very much. Where are we pride? Oh, hold up for this guy. 
yet. All right. So, uh, and just so you know, when we speak for about 30 minutes, there will probably be time for Q&A. Uh, we do have some chairs up in the front row. If you don't mind sitting up front, you get a better view of Cliff Landing, which is always fun. Uh, um, handsome. 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 Professor. And I think Mary, right? Yes. He's married. Sorry, ladies. But uh, you can still sit in the front row. Um, so anyways, Cliff's going to speak for a while. He'll take some Q&A. And then at the end, we do introductions. Okay? So that's really nice. We go around the whole room of 200 people, or whoever, how many people are in this room, and you get to introduce yourself briefly. Right? We're all good at that. We always do it. We finish about 1 o'clock. Um, Roger Rail is filming this live. So if you're at home, you can be watching this live. How many people do we got, Roger? Zero people watching. Come on. Where's Iceland? You got a lot of them. Yeah, well, where's Iceland? I think the people in Iceland aren't showing up because they're out of this country, but we have a big fan contingency in Iceland, so. I think they're all here. Yeah, they're here? Okay. We need to have a, a, a group that goes to Iceland as ambassadors so we can work on that. But anyways, I'll shut up because I talk too much. So, uh, Cliff Lampy, uh, he's a U of M School of Information guy, very smart guy. I was able to work with him a little bit at MSU because he was at MSU for a couple years, but now he's back in Ann Arbor which is great. Any School of Information students or faculty in the room? Sounds Cliff. Okay, great. Um, yeah, but I know we have a lot of people that came out to see him today. So let's give Cliff Lampy a big warm round of applause. And welcome him. Right. 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 Everybody hear me okay? Good? So, uh, as Derek said, I am Cliff. I am a professor at the School of Information here at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. How many of you have ever heard of the School of Information before? Just a few of you. How many of you are surprised that there's a school of information? That seems like what all schools are for, right? Is to provide information. Uh, previous to this, I was at uh, the University of Michigan, or I'm sorry, Michigan State University in the Communication Arts Program for six years. And I see at least one former colleague, Joe, back there, and a few other uh, uh, MSU folks. And I'm a big fan of both institutions. So my PhD is actually in information, and I study what's called socio-technical system. Uh, if you want to be fancy about it, but we often call it social media, right? And that seems to be the more popular term. And I'm not the only one. I'm not the only uh, lucky person who's able to trick the world into giving me this job. Uh, there are lots of us, actually, who study social media out in the world. And you'd, you'd be surprised where they come from. So lots of academic institutions now have serious academic programs around interaction on social media. And uh, uh, as well, a lot of the big industry shops have PhD researchers who are studying social media. So. Facebook has an entire data science team that is made up of PhDs from all over the country and world who do research on Facebook interactions. Twitter hires PhDs to do research. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, all of these groups hire tons of PhDs to do lots and lots of social media research about how people are using their system. So how many of you are active social media users? How many of you would rather not? <laughs> Uh, but it does feel necessary these days. And I, I, being an academic, I like to define terms. And I like to think about what do I mean when I'm talking about social media? Because it's one of these terms that I'm pretty sure Tim O'Reilly invented that we all use. And everybody uses in slightly different ways, right? What actually is social media? And Fred Cavazza has these great diagrams where he shows kind of the entire range of different platforms that can be included in social media. We tend to think of the big ones like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, right? But there are literally dozens if not hundreds of these platforms that are out there. And they change and they shift and they evolve almost continuously. Uh, I usually think of something as having three characteristics that help define whether or not it's actually a social media platform, right? One is that it's dependent almost entirely on user-generated content. Twitter, if it weren't for all of us who they have somehow tricked into supplying all these 140 character messages, would be an empty place. Facebook, without our profile information, would be empty. All of these different sites would are entirely dependent on us to provide the content that uh, fills up the sites. The other common characteristic for all social media sites is that they're very much dependent on user-to-user -user interaction, right? This is differentiating it from an older form of media that we used to call mass media where you had gatekeepers and you had kind of this one-to-many broadcast. And basically these experts were in charge of the information, whether it be a newspaper editor or a person who owned a TV station, and they decided what information got sent out. With direct user-to-user, many-to-many interaction, everybody becomes both a producer and a consumer of content from each other. And that is a vast paradigmatic shift in how we consume information, probably unprecedented since Gutenberg came up with his uh, typing machine. 
right? So this is uh, what makes it very different. The other thing that is always common in social media applications that we tend to undervalue is that social media tools aren't one tool, they're actually a bundle of tools, right? When you look at a site like Facebook, Facebook isn't one piece of software, it's actually two dozen pieces of software with one pretty package. So Facebook includes picture hosting, it includes an API to make games, it includes asynchronous messaging, synchronous messaging, rating systems. So all of these are separate tools and some designer somewhere is making decisions about what tools are meaningful for their users. Right? So in each of these systems, they're making these definite design decisions that create architecture around the site. So let's see how some different social media that we might consider, are they social media and do they fit my, my little definition here? So how many Pinterest users do I have? That's about right, uh, given normal populations. Pinterest <laughs> is the new uh, growing social media site that's out there. And you can see it has some of the characteristics I'm talking about. All Pinterest is, every piece of information on it is provided by one of its users, right? Users are repinning each other's content, which is that direct user to user interaction. And it's definitely a bundle of applications. I can repin something, I can comment on something, I can create a new pin board, so it has all of those characteristics. Wikipedia. How many of you have, uh, are, have used Wikipedia in the last week? Most of us have, right? How many of you have been told never to trust Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say that's true, but then I'm a hippie liberal, so I say don't trust anything. Uh, you know, I've got my tinfoil hat and everything. But Wikipedia actually has this very involved and detailed social process that goes on behind it. There's direct user-to-user -user interaction. It's obviously filled out by users, and it's a very strong bundle of applications, including robots. Craigslist. Is Craigslist social media? Absolutely it is, right? It is all user-generated content. It's a bundle of tools uh, of different types that some designer, uh, a designer who got stuck in the early 1990s, decided it uh, was a cool for us to have. Uh, he's, he's actually just keeps a time, it's like Groundhog's Day, it's like a website designer. Uh, and it's direct user user interaction. Reddit, how many of you are regular Reddit users? So with my undergraduates, about 85% of you are raising your hands right now, right? Reddit is uh, something that's really popular as a news aggregator that a lot of, especially younger people, read, and it's a social media site like many of the others. So you can kind of get a sense of the vast range of possible tasks that you can accomplish through social media, the types of conversations you can have, and the things you can do. So, she does live in Arizona. Oh, right. But it is a small world, especially through social media. So what is going on with social media? Because there are so many of these things and such a constantly evolving platform, who can you trust for information? Because you know, all of these companies are providing how much, how many unique users they have, but unique users is a vast underrepresentation of how many people are actually using the site, right? And if you look at Google Plus as an example, how many of you have a Google Plus account? And how many of you use Google Plus regularly? A couple of you, right? But you can see the differences. Even though we make an account on something, doesn't mean we're users, per se. Um, so those numbers are always inflated when they come from the companies themselves. There's still, you can kind of see some differences along with popular types. So here's a few very popular types of social media, but I wouldn't include Dig necessarily in the same list as the infographics designer did. But here's some that we consider to be social media, right? So Twitter, obviously, is one of the big players. Facebook, of course. YouTube, Google+, Tumblr, all of these are kind of growing and very popular social media sites. But when you look at their kind of size of audience, they become vastly different in terms of how popular each of these things are, right? And I have some specific numbers on this coming up, but uh, the, the actual number of users for each of these things, even though they can be massive, like even the small one here at 17 million is a huge number of users, it's, you know, there, there are huge differences in the size of these. So why does size of the social network site matter? Well, largely it's because of network effects, right? A lot of the reason that we find that people participate in a social media site is because they want an audience, and you want to go where the audience is. That's why Facebook tends to be so sticky, isn't because they're doing anything necessarily better on an interface level than anybody else, but it's where your friends are, right? It's where your audience is, it's where your clients are, it's where you know people are going to be there, and that makes it kind of a, a rich picking for getting what you want. 
So not only are the number of people on these things huge, but the kind of scale of what they're doing and how much interaction takes place on any one of these sites is big. Even sites that we don't consider kind of that much of a social media site. So like Wikipedia, for instance, gets something like 2,000 requests per second for information. Right? Across the world somewhere, 2,000 people are requesting a page every second from Wikipedia. Now that's all Wikipedia is, and we, you may not know that English Wikipedia is only one of 120 different versions of Wikipedia. There are many languages in which Wikipedia is the only encyclopedia, not just the best one. So you know, the, the, all of these sites and the interaction taking place on these sites, when you look at Twitter, how many of you have followed, like used tweets that can follow a, a popular hashtag on Twitter, and you can't even follow it, it's just moving too fast, we're right to follow, right? The amount of attention and uh, information going by is just growing exponentially. And more and more of the population is participating. So these numbers are taken from the Pew Internet and American Life Project. I like these numbers because they're based on a random digit dial of US households. And so scientifically, they're top notch, right? They're not going to be inflated or have some of the same error that companies self-reporting their data are going to have. So these are really trustable numbers. For you. And they're showing that by the end of 2011, about 65% of all internet using Americans had used social media, or social networks at least and about 43% of them had used yesterday. That number we know, uh, that we haven't published the results yet, has grown uh, pretty quickly. When you break that up by age, you can see that there's huge age differences in who are adopting social network sites at least, right? Uh, with younger people, as we all kind of presume, having a nice uh, kind of high level of integration, and then the older generations, myself included, kind of coming along more slowly in terms of how we use some of these sites. Twitter use uh, has grown fairly heavily over the past few years. Twitter started in 2006, uh, had a really slow period of incubation, it was in, it has never really caught up with Facebook in terms of number of users, but especially in the younger generation of users right now, Twitter is becoming a much more popular social network platform. Once mom gets on Facebook, Facebook's no longer cool, right? <laughs> and that's, that's as true for me, actually, as it was for high school students. Like, when my mom got on Facebook, I was pretty sure it was over. Um, so what do they do is they move to a different social network platform. Uh, they overcome the switching costs, basically, of giving up the network they've already groomed and maintained, and they move to another site. Why are people getting on these sites? You know, it, before 2005 and 2004, when Facebook changed the game by requiring everybody to use their real name to sign up for a website, uh, people were getting on to meet people who were of mutual interest, right? Like, if I'm really into raising rabbits, I can meet other people who are really into raising rabbits or whatever crazy or thing I'm into. Uh, when Facebook required real IDs, they changed the game, and then now what we're doing is we're basically replicating our offline social networks into this online environment. Right? And that doesn't necessarily mean they're our friends, but they're people that we would recognize, yes, I recognize our relationship, and I'm not going to kill you if I see you, kind of thing, right? Uh, so what they're mostly doing, and what everybody did is predominantly uses these sites for, is to actually stay in touch with friends or colleagues of different types. So who's on Pinterest? I apologize, this is very numbery, uh, this particular table, but I wanted to give good attribution and let you see some of the details here. So Pinterest is one of these new up-and-coming social media sites. It's one of the big ones. Uh, and it's growing quickly, but still only 12% of all internet users use Pinterest, right? And if you look, that number is predominantly females. 19% of female internet users use Pinterest as compared to only 5% of male internet users. So you can kind of see some of these demographics, some of how these sites are evolving and this kind of rich ecology of sites are being broken up by our demographic characteristics and who has what kinds of goals. Um, age groups are remarkably consistent. Like if you look at the different age groups that are on, on um, Pinterest, it looks like women of all ages like Pinterest. Instagram, how many of you are Instagram users? The, yeah, few of you. So Instagram is another one of those. Uh, we made big news and we bought up for a bunch of money, and it, it has a lot of uh, use. But it's about 12% of total internet users use Instagram, right? Now that's evenly divided between men and women, but you can see the huge age skew for Instagram. It's only that 18 to 29 demographic that's using Instagram in huge numbers. Uh, the rest of the demographics aren't as uh, richly using it, though there's some users. It's also skewed to some college, 
which is often code for college students. Tumblr, the blogging service, right? Tumblr is a great service, and it's um, something that people use much more frequently. But you can see here again that even though only 5% of the US internet using population uses Tumblr, that's heavily skewed again to that 18 to 29 demographic. So in this case, while Facebook has really taken off across all age demographics, you can see some of these smaller or niche social media sites are being repopulated by uh, 18 to 29 year olds fleeing Facebook, or at least fleeing some of their activity. So let's compare that to Facebook. We're up to about 66% of the internet using population using Facebook currently uh, in the United States. Um, it's much different in other countries. Facebook it has about maybe a quarter of its users now are in North America and everybody else is across the world. Uh, they gain about one million users per day, Facebook does. But most of that's international growth at this point. The US market is relatively saturated. Uh, men and women, no differences, but you can see some differences in terms of age groups still with Facebook, right? That 18 to 29 demographic is still holding steady at about 83%, uh, and all of the other people are kind of coming along with them. The other real change here uh, over the past few years is that annual income. Uh, so basically this is a measure of wealth, right? It used to be that Facebook was predominantly rich white kids. Why? Because they were in college. Started in college, absolutely. So uh, that, and MySpace was where poor white Americans or uh, minorities would hang out. So well, that has shifted, obviously, over the past several years. Pew doesn't track um, ethnicity numbers, but the income levels have definitely flip-flopped over the past six years on Facebook. LinkedIn, the social network site, I tell my students that their parents want them to use. Yep. Right? <laughs> and I'm sure that's important for a lot of, uh, that's an important thing for a lot of you guys. Only about 20% of the internet using population uses LinkedIn, right? No differences in men and women, but you can see here, the age uh, skew is a little telling, right? Because 30 to 49 and 50 to 64 are much more likely to be using LinkedIn than some of these other age demographics. There's also a big wealth gap. The richer you are, the more likely you are to be using LinkedIn, and an education gap, which is, of course, inextricably linked with uh, wealth at some level. Twitter. So Twitter is about 16% of the U.S. internet using population. To hear the media talk about it, Twitter is used by about 120% of the internet using population, right? Uh, and most of that, most people are pretty stupid. But the, the actual number is about 20%, only this number. Now, when you dig into these numbers a little bit, you can get see this is hugely skewed to a younger demographic, but other than that, it's pretty even across multiple other types of people. Um, when I talk to people at Twitter about this number and about kind of their footprint compared to the actual size of their organization, one of the things they say is that they're used by the hipsters and the intellectual centers of their networks, right? So Twitter may not have a ton of users, but the people who use it are more influential in their networks. We don't have any empirical evidence of that, but uh, you might have at least some impression of that based off your own views. So anything surprising in those numbers? Anything that you find truly puzzling? Yeah? Why would you say it's interesting that age-wise there's a spike in 18 to 29 and then again in 65 plus? So yeah, so there, there tends to be and everybody has experienced this, I think, to some extent, right? Where the, the common narrative is that young people love the social media, and the older you get, the less likely you are to use it. That's not true across all social media, of course. But why, why might 18 to 29 year olds be more ready adopters? Yeah? So some of it might be internet uh, or technology proficiency, but it's actually not that. When we do studies of that, it's not because they're proficient, it's because they're actually in a psychosocial stage of development where they're building their networks, right? Once you hit 30, most of your friends stay the same. When you're 18, you're actually constructing and building new social networks all the time, and these tools become a little bit more salient for actually uh, the work of grooming and building networks. Plus, they, as much as they don't think they do, they have more free time. Than right? So it allows them a little more time to participate online. I always feel guilty saying that. But, you know. All right, so 
I mentioned that there's a bunch of us, both in the universities and in industry, who are researching uh, uh, social media use more broadly. And I thought I'd highlight just a couple of really broad strokes of some consistent findings that people are finding across different social media sites at different places. What are the, some of the things that we're pretty sure of at this point? You can never get an academic to admit they're 100% sure of something, but these are things we're pretty sure. So a series of studies have looked at the relationship between social media use, and in particular social network site use, and the generation of social capital. How many of you have heard the term social capital? A couple of you. It's basically like physical capital or human capital. It's the resources and um, benefits that you get from being connected within a social network, right? So if you needed to borrow a thousand bucks, who would you go to? You know, probably a close friend, family member, or somebody like that. If you needed to find out uh, what's fun to do in San Francisco, it might be a more distant friend. So we know that different structures of social networks lead to different outcomes. We also know that participation in a site like Facebook can really allow you to groom broader, more distributed networks of people that allow you to have access to social capital benefits that non-Facebook users don't. Now there's a couple of subtleties in this story. This works for fairly heavy Facebook users, and it works for people who are actually using Facebook, i.e. they're posting their own content, they're uh, uh, liking things, they're commenting on other people's updates. How many of you have a Facebook account but only ever read content on Facebook? Whoever is. Those, you guys get none of these benefits, right? And in fact, your levels of depression and loneliness are much higher. Than <laughs> I'm sure not as individuals, in the aggregate. So like Facebook users don't get a ton of these benefits, but for those who are heavier users, they do seem to reap a ton of social capital benefits from their participation over time. Another thing that we studied uh, and has been true for a long time is that use is massively, and motivation to use are massively heterogeneous. Why do people use Facebook? There's no one answer to that, right? People use Facebook to share pictures of their kids. They use Facebook to play Cityville. They use Facebook to uh, check out the news. They use Facebook to talk to friends. They use Facebook to creep on their ex-girlfriend. They use Facebook to do a wide range of things. So individuals in themselves can have multiple reasons to use Facebook. But then when you look across individuals at the population level, there are vast differences in both how people perceive the benefits of Facebook and how people perceive themselves using it, right? So a great example is political discussion. This is salient for today's times, right? Uh, how many of you have Facebook friends who are posting political messages on Facebook? Right? How many of you wish they would stop? <laughs> right. Yes. So, you know, these are very different perspectives on how people feel like Facebook, Facebook should be used. Participation is always unequal in social media sites. This is probably the most consistent scientific finding we have in my field, which is that no matter what the site, no matter what the topic, no matter who uses it, uh, we have what we call the power law distribution of participation. Right? Many of you have probably noticed this in your own work, but a very small number of people do the majority of the work. Right? This is true on Facebook, this is true on Twitter, this is true in my classroom, this is true in my department. You know, I'll settle them. I shouldn't say that, that's not a thing. So, so no, this, is a, this is a general human tendency, but it's at, at even more true in these online environments. We think of Wikipedia as an example of being edited by the world. We think there's this myth that Wikipedia is edited by these, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. In truth, about 90% of all edits made on Wikipedia are made by only 10,000 people. Right? It's a small group of people who are doing the majority of the work on that site. And that's true again and again and again. When I do work with nonprofits on setting up social media sites, the consistent story I hear is our users are different. Our audience is different. Everybody will participate. We'll have 90% participation rates because our people care about things. They, I'm sure they do, but the, the law is the same, right? That's why they call it a law. All right. Um, the other consistent finding is that there's a complex interaction between the technology in these systems and the social outcomes that they uh, impel, right? So uh, a good example is many of you who are old Facebook users, like myself, may remember a time before the news feed, right? The news feed on Facebook is that aggregated list of what all your friends are doing. When Facebook first came out, they didn't have that. Right? So they, they innovated this in the fall of 2005, and what happened? Everyone freaked out. 
Everybody freaked out. They complained, they formed groups to leave Facebook, they, 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 they had this huge protest. So what really happened? What really happened is people spent three times as much time on Facebook per day, and the size of the site grew exponentially within three months after introducing the news feed. Right? What the news feed did is it reduced the cost of paying attention to a large group of people. Right? It's a design decision, it's a tool that was made that reduced basically the transaction cost of keeping touch with 100 friends. The average size of a Facebook network is about 108. The average size of a Facebook network before people 18 to 29 is about 450. Uh, heavy Facebook users typically have over 1,000 Facebook friends. Right? Keeping track of 1,000 people is costly. I could not in any way go and check the profile individually of all those people, but what Facebook does is they, don't, they save me from that work by aggregating them. That's just a small example of the complex interactions that take place between social outcomes, which is basically the feeling of connection I have between these Facebook users, and the tools some nameless, faceless designer, actually I know the guy's name, uh, in, in uh, Facebook headquarters out in Palo Alto made about what Facebook should be like, right? So that's one of the things my research area really tries to do is to understand those complex interactions. The problem becomes is the guy in uh, uh, Palo Alto who designed the site isn't really reading the research literature that we're creating. And in general, what's happening is that these social media sites are creating their best guess and seeing what works. And then because of this perpetual data idea in social media, if it doesn't work, they just roll it back. Facebook has had a lot of failures, right? Uh, the beacon system for social marketing, uh, some of their privacy policies. And every now and then, they'll just pay attention to how does it really affect use, and they'll roll it back if they need it. But you know, this intuition, the idea that I know what my users like is almost always wrong, partially because users are so heterogeneous, and people overassume that they know about their users. All right, so things we're not studying in academia, but we really should be, and this is true not just of me, uh, but of my entire field. One is attention across channels. We know almost nothing as academics about how a person uses Facebook and Twitter at the same time. We know a lot about how people use Facebook, we know a lot about how people use Twitter, but we don't know about the intersection between those two things. Any guesses on why that is? Because Facebook and Twitter are privately owned companies and they don't make their data available. Right? Scientists depend on data. We don't have access to the data, so we can't tell anything. And of course, Facebook and Twitter are competitors, so it's not like they're sharing their data with each other to be able to compare notes about what one user is doing on both their sites. This is, to me, like this unimaginable loss of ability to be able to understand these social processes and these sites. We don't know about how any of these things affect our use in other channels. So if I learn about something on Twitter, do I post it on Facebook? But even more importantly, do I do something differently offline because of what I learned online? That's something huge that we don't know. We also don't know about what are the long-term effects of these patterns of participation. You know, I hear a lot of accusations that young people don't understand the true value of friendship anymore, or that they don't look you in the eye when they speak to you, or about all these things. I've yet to see any empirical evidence that any of that's true. Right? And it, it, it could be that it's just not there yet, and that people are totally right in what they're saying. But it's hard to fund and conduct long-term research studies. Uh, it's much easier to do a survey of undergrads, so scientists don't do it because we're inherently lazy. And then we still need to do more work on how these tools affect behavior. Right? When uh, Facebook changed its layout to the timelines, that had a huge effect on the social processes on Facebook, but we don't know what it is. And because Facebook has limited ability to work with scientists, Rightfully so, they have other priorities that they need to pursue. It's hard for us to really understand these things over time. So I want to leave a few minutes for questions. So I think you know, let's end there. We still have like five or ten minutes for questions, I think, and have a conversation about it. So thanks everybody, and hope some of that was helpful. Thank you so much, um, some really insightful information about our social media. Questions from the board? So a question on uh, how much people are really using these tools to make purchasing decisions or looking for referrals from others. You know, pick just one example, Facebook, obviously a ton of users. How many actually use Facebook, you know, 
know, specifically looking for feedback from others to look at products or help solve the problem when you have to About 7%. 7%. Yeah, so we actually have, I just finished a study where we were looking at the number of people who sought for social recommendations on Facebook, and this is work that's been done at Microsoft Research as well, using Facebook interactions. And about 7% of people will go through and ask their friends for advice on what to buy or uh, services to make. Uh, or I should, say, I should say that more carefully. 7% of updates uh, were about social recommendations. So it could be a smaller number of friends, of people, or a larger number. But about 7% of total status updates were about social recommendations. We have another question at that. What can you tell me about branch out? I'm not up on branch out yet. Mix tied in with Facebook. I actually don't know anything about it either, guys. So okay. I can't tell you. It's a, it's a new professional, just like LinkedIn, but it's through Facebook and it's called Branch Out. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the basic principle of it is this idea of context collapse, which is a huge area in our field, right? The idea that I don't want to be on Facebook with my work colleagues who are also able to see what my crazy Aunt Sally posts to my status updates, right? And so Branch Out and Google Plus are both. That sounds like, I don't know branch out yet, but predicated on the idea that people want context, that they want to preserve their privacy across social contexts. The evidence is they don't, right? When we look at Google Plus and we look at early evidence about how people are setting up their Google Plus profiles, most of the time they spend a good bit of time setting up these separate circles that they dump people into and then completely ignoring those separate circles as they post their content and just posting publicly, right? So. You know, very few people are making nuanced decisions. You know, and, and, and Facebook, Facebook has much the same system. Like on Facebook, you can go and subdivide all of your users. About five percent of Facebook users have taken an opportunity to do that. Oh, we've got lots of questions. Again, at the back. Do you have predictions for the future? Social media. Sure, they're always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give us a sample. <laughs> I mean, when Facebook first came out, I was like, oh great, another orchid. You know, who needs another MySpace? MySpace is going to last forever. Uh, I think I think one of the things we're going to see is a continued growth in the ecology of social media sites. I think Facebook will act much like Google moving forward, where it's going to be kind of a kind of a social system that everybody has a foothold in but they're enacting a lot of their other motivations through other more niche social media sites. So I think we're going to see, continue to see a lot of innovation about that, but over the next few years it's going to chill out a little bit because the uh, lack of success in the Facebook IPO has kind of put a little bit of a cloud over development in social media platforms in Silicon Valley, and the new hotness is stuff like Square, which is Jack Dorsey's new product uh, to do social commerce, or, or at least mobile commerce more easily. So, I think it's going to be a little level out for a couple of years, but like I said, I'm always wrong. Okay, do you have a question? Uh, do you have data on what type of um, content people interact with the most on Facebook? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so Pew has some stuff and we collect some stuff. The, the thing that people do, especially over the past couple of years, is photo and video sharing, right? They for, they frame this as curation, but my library friends, that, that term drives them nuts. Um, <laughs> But it, it, uh, and a lot of it is kind of reposting content or sharing content. So I think uh, uh, the way our brains are wired, photo and video content is a major way that they're sharing. In the past, we've seen things go from Friendster to MySpace to Facebook. Um, Facebook obviously being the predominant one right now as far as size. Do you see perhaps another one on the rise or what is your I, what's your idea about what you think will happen in that realm? Yeah, I, don't, I don't see anything taking uh, over from Facebook anytime soon, right? I think Google Plus was as likely and reasonable a suspect as we've seen for the past four or five years. Uh, and even Google, well not even Google, but I think Google is rightfully reframing Google Plus not as a social network service, but as a social spine that connects their other products. Um, so I think Facebook is going to be fairly dominant for a while. Though Twitter is going to play kind of this very much a uh, rebel alliance to their Death Star kind of role <laughs> in, uh, and still be around for a while. My grade point will not allow me to take any of your classes at the University of Michigan. Um, but are there any classes or uh, areas we can go to, to stay current, to learn more, to 
get up to get up to speed more. And there are a lot of great online sources for stuff like this. I mean, Nashville does a passable job at some of this information. Uh, I think um, I still read Slashdot, but I'm old. Um, you know, I think Pew Internet, if you keep track of what they're doing, they really track the numbers on these things, and they do a great job. P-E-W. Oh, it's P-E-W. Um, and in terms of classes, actually Derek, I think, already split, but his social media driver's license is just a, an incredible opportunity to learn more about these issues. I'll give him a plug. Uh, and that, that's just a really nice opportunity. And then at the university, there are several classes that are, have related topics to this area. Thank you. Oh, um, when it comes to, I guess, people's profiles, how much, what percentage, I guess, or what data is there on what how people separate themselves professionally and personally. So do people have separate how how integrated are they? So mine's a Facebook account. They have two Facebook accounts depending on what they're using it for. They just have one account. They basically don't segment at all right. or how much they segment according to professional versus personal information. Yeah, there is some data on this, right? And the data is that people follow basically three dominant strategies. One is what Bernie Hogan at Oxford calls the least common denominator, which they have one online profile, but it's got the least objectionable vanilla total stuff possible, right? Like the close content that anybody's gonna find acceptable. The other strategy is what you're hypothesizing, which is they'll create separate social media profiles, like this my Twitter accounts for work and my Facebook accounts for home, right? And there's a lot of people who do that. I would say these are roughly, let's say 20% of the audience. And then there's another 20% who will uh, create two Facebook profiles, I guess in terms of use of Facebook I might add, and have their professional Facebook identity and their uh, home uh, uh, Facebook identity. Because it's super awkward if your boss Facebook friends you, so you have to turn that down. And, and then you get all like, oh, I don't use Facebook for this. So, so people, uh, when we studied staff people at a large university, that, they, that was one of their dominant strategies, was to separate that out. Um, regarding photo sharing, uh, Flickr versus Instagram, Flickr has uh, huge, huge numbers, but um, Facebook paid a fortune for Instagram. Yeah. I was wondering why. Now, my, my son is a photographer. He's got about 4,000 followers on Instagram now. Yeah. So the interaction seems to be totally different. Can you give me your take on all of that? Yeah, is anybody guess what the largest photo sharing site on the web is? Facebook. the web. Facebook, for sure, right? Um, yeah. Flickr makes me sad. Flickr, uh, and it makes me a little bit angry at Yahoo for how they treated Flickr when they bought it. Uh, Flickr should be much more user-friendly and seamless than it currently is. And Flickr is still great for kind of a hardcore professional like photography artist community but it is niche now compared to Instagram and Facebook. Partially because the, uh, the latter two are so much easier to use that it's ridiculous. And it's all about cost benefit ratios, right? Like if you up the cost in terms of friction to use a site, people are gonna go use the easier site. Like that's just a consistent point. We have time for just one more question at the back. Thank you. Do you know of any case studies that illustrate the use of social media and results in business promotion, strictly business. You know, I understand the person, but strictly business. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there, the role of social media in business has a couple of different dimensions. There's been a large body of studies about social media use within a business organization uh, in order to promote like interconnections, knowledge management, things like that. What you're talking more about is the strict marketing, right? How effective is it if I put an ad on Facebook? Um, and I. I would imagine that that work exists, but I don't know it because the marketing is not my area. We've had some great questions and some fantastic answers. Please put your hands together again for Cliff Lang. There were lots of other hands. Uh, Cliff, will you hang around for a few minutes afterwards? So um, if you do have a burning question, please come see Cliff after. Now is the portion of our la 2 meeting where we pass the microphone. This is your chance to stand up, please. Introduce yourself if you have a particular ask or you're promoting your personal business. Please do so now. 
very different other than your pasta. Jack Brisbane.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Murray, the big guy at Good Stuff Studios. And uh, Journey is probably the worst band to ever play anything. Uh, no, maybe the Beatles. Sorry, that's not true at all. I love the Beatles. Journey is horrible. Anyway, I say these things just uh, to get attention because that's pretty much what Good Stuff Studios does with our full graphics, branding, and photography. It's good times. We have fun with it. So if you guys need any of that help, please let me know. Thanks. Hello, I am Mario Marola. Um, I'm a senior in high school, one three. I'm also an intern at Celio Inc., which is located right up the street on the Reed, in the Phoenix building. Hi, uh, Henry Gerard, uh, BMRT, business manager at Scotland High School, and also an intern at Metro Delivery. Gun, and uh, I'm an intern at EMU with the Digital Inclusion Club and the business side of youth, and I'm also a senior at Skyline High School. I'm Matthew Wallace. Uh, I'm also a senior at Skyline High School, and I am interning with Mario at CEO as well. Hi, I'm Mary Lindsay. I'm also a senior at Skyline High School, and I am Mark Johnson. I'm a social media marketer with an emphasis on the AEC industry. That's architecture, engineering, construction, and building products. Hi, I'm Scott Phillips, and I maintain a website uh, as a hobby called 723 Spring Street. It's the house I live in locally. It was Ann Arbor's first lead platinum home. So if you want to learn anything about energy efficiency, just check out 723springstreet.com. Margo. I am the business magnet lead teacher at Skyline and I brought all these wonderful students with me today. I'm Mary Goldberg. <laughs> I'm a senior at Skyline and I'm sorry if I scared anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's all funny when you it's camo day, so. <laughs> I'm Roger Rail. I do video here and several other networking groups to help share information in the community. And I uh, just wanted to let everybody know that October 25th is the next Ann Arbor Ignite, Ignite Ann Arbor number seven. We got our 16 speakers to talk for five minutes apiece on all sorts of different topics. So sign up at the Ignite Ann Arbor site. I'm Dennis Kapinski, I do sales and marketing. I also help Roger out with the video thing in here. And don't forget about Carter Sherline's Frog Print Studios, $50 special today. <laughs> I'm Dan Blakemore. My company is called Health Insurance Marketplace, and my elevator speech is short and to the point. I sell health insurance. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Allen. I'm Allie Norris, and I'm also an intern at Ingenix. Hi, I'm Erin O'Neill. I am a content producer at Ingenix, and I'm also the Ally 2 m live tweeter. Um, we are, um, Ingenix is hosting a digital chat on Friday regarding um, building brand influence with clout. We would love to have you participate. So Friday at 3 p.m., hop on Twitter, follow at Ingenix, um, Derek at Maribon, or me at E.K. O'Neill. Um, and we will have a wonderful and lively discussion about cloud and building brand influence online. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michelle Woods, and I'm the director of our career services office at U University of Michigan School of Social Work. Hi, I'm Alana Napo. I manage the volunteers and the marketing at the Habitat for Humanity of Karen Valley Restore in Ann Arbor. Um, so the Restore is a giant warehouse of donated furniture, appliances, and other things for the home that we sell for huge discounts and then the proceeds from that go back towards our home bills and it's open to the public seven days a week um, and it's also a great place for students to volunteer and um, get to put here. Hi, I'm Karen Shelley. I'm also a Habitat. I am the manager of corporate relations and I'm looking for anybody who might be interested in sponsoring some events we have coming up and especially Veterans Day, we're doing a special Veterans Day build. If anybody wants to get involved, come see me. Hi, I'm uh, Mary Lou Olds. I'm the uh, manager at LA Today. Thanks everybody for turning out. We uh, really appreciate you attending and, and, and please come back. Also, uh, we um, are now uh, starting to pursue speakers for next uh, season. So if you are a speaker and you know someone that's a speaker, 
here, please see me uh, for more information about how to proceed. Also, if you would like one of these lovely t-shirts, um, which half of which goes to our scholarship fund. Um, so see me about that as well. I'll be hanging around and uh, we can talk about that. Thank you. number one fan. <laughs> Jack Dorsey has taken on Wall Street. Anyone who hasn't read about what he has done needs to. He is creating jobs. He has brought credit card processing to small business, and he is a superstar. Thanks. Okay. Well, Dennis already introduced me twice, I guess, but Carter Schoen from Print Studios, commercial editorial and portrait photography from a different point of view. Yeah. Normally, social networks. David is going to give us the three rules of content for social networking. See you next week at LA2M. Thank you.